So we are in uh, session four here, and as we consider this session of the book of Amos, we want to consider this closing statement of hope that Amos leaves us with. Now, as I said in an earlier session, this is consistent with all of the prophets, that the prophets, it was, it was never the prophets' intention just to be the bearer of bad news. And unfortunately, at times, these are the kinds of perspectives that people have given us on the prophets. And it really is a caricature because the prophets uh, gave both bad news and good news. And so as, as Amos has given us the bad news, he also gives us good news as Hosea did and as Isaiah did as well. You will find in all of the prophets that this is what happens. And so in the 700s, <clears throat> we have Amos predicting uh, something that we're going to look at in Acts chapter 15, where God, based on what the Messiah has done, God is including the Gentiles among his people. And you'll find when you get through the book of Isaiah that Isaiah does the same thing at about the same time. And so in chapter 9 and verse 11, after we have just looked at these five rather devastating visions of what's going to happen to the nation of Israel, that Amos begins to tell us Good news. Now, remember, when Amos is prophesying this and predicting these things, the behavior of the people has not changed one bit. The people are still being unjust. The people are still being unrighteous. The people are still worshiping idols. The people are still running after their neighbor's wives. They're still doing all of these terrible things. But yet Amos, after he talks about the judgment that's coming, he's, he's going to say, you know what? But yet God is so wonderful. God cannot let go of his covenant people, and there is going to come a time where he's going to restore you. And so in chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, in that day, and he's, often in the prophets when you see the phrase in that day, that's a messianic reference, and you want to just consider that as you're interpreting the prophets. He says, in that day. I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches. So you see a, a real shift in tone here that you don't want to miss. And if you think of inductive Bible study practice, what we're looking at is contrast, right? That you uh, take not only the tone, but the very words that you had everything going in one direction, which was all bad just a few verses earlier. And now in 9-11, there is a real turn. God says, I'm going to repair its breaches. I'm going to raise up its ruins. I'm going to rebuild it as in the days of old. Well, the Lord, just a few verses earlier, said he's going to destroy everything. So now he's rebuilding. He said that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming. So notice what Amos does here. He says that there is a future with God. He says, days are coming where I'm going to do something. And he talks about all of these wonderful things that are going to happen. But, but the primary thing you see here in verse 13 is such a picture of prosperity, which is uh, pictured as a, and interpreted in the New Testament as a coming of the Messianic age. The mountain shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. And what you have is this picture of really positive good things are going to happen in the future for the people of God. And in verse 14, he writes, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant the vineyards and drink the wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. Now, this is a picture of rejoicing. And this is just the opposite, if you remember, of what was coming out of the temple. Instead of the songs of praise, when God had them under his judgment, it was songs of wailing. Now, God says there's going to be again rejoicing. There's going to be good stuff that happens to my people. And in verse 15, he says, I'm going to plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land which I have given them, says the Lord. Now, this planting on the land is referred to in Acts chapter 15 as something much bigger than simply a piece of real estate. And the land that they're going to be planted on is actually the new heavens and the new earth. And so Acts chapter 15 actually interprets what we just have looked at in Amos chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 15, you know, there's this big discussion that goes on in the early church about how people can be brought into the kingdom of God. And it was specifically about Gentiles. And the conclusion was, of course, that there were a few ethical things that the Jewish members of the early church wanted Gentiles 
uh, to avoid and uh, some ethical things that the, uh, that the Jews wanted them to participate in. And other than that, it was all good. They could come into the church without being circumcised, without practicing a lot of the Jewish things. And in chapter 15, it's very interesting the way Paul and Barnabas begin this theological discussion that I think we don't want to miss. If you think of the thrust of Acts chapter 15 as a theological thrust, they're talking about theology. In other words, what's the theology of salvation of the early church? What is the theology of salvation for the Gentiles? And it's interesting what Paul does in 15.12. Acts 15.12, all the assembly kept silence and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And it's wonderful to consider that when Paul and Barnabas got involved in a theological discussion, Paul did not begin by giving a didactic teaching on theology. Paul began a discussion of theology by talking about signs and wonders. And I think that's something we don't want to miss. That as we are looking at cognitive truth, as we're thinking about these elements that all of us are very much involved with and want to see the truth of God go forward, what we don't ever want to forget are the wonderful things, the wonderful signs and wonders that God does for people and to people to bring them into the kingdom. And so this has happened with Paul and with Barnabas. And so they, they relate all these wonders that God did. And so after they finish speaking, then James stands up and he says, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and with this the words of the prophet agree. And then James begins talking about the book of Amos. And what he says about Amos is very, very important. He quotes Amos. He says, after this, I'm going to return. Now we think of this in context with everything else God said through Amos. And he says, I'm going to rebuild the dwelling of David. I'm going to rebuild its ruins. I will set it up. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who has made these things known from of old. Therefore, my, ju my judgment is... Let's include the Gentiles. If they'll humble themselves, call on the name of Jesus, say they want to live right in God's eyes, abstain from idols, abstain from pollution. Exactly the kinds of things God was calling for in the book of Amos. That the people, the Gentiles who are being included into God's people, that they would live upright and ethical lives coming into the church of God. Now, as we consider this, I think this takes us, in, in my opinion, to one of the two major points of emphasis in the book of Amos. Often when we study Amos in academic settings, they will talk about the idea of injustice, that there needs to be social justice, that the, the oppression should not be uh, in cultures, and that we as the church should be the prophet of God going to cultures and speaking the word of God uh, ethically to cultures, which is all good. But to me, it's very interesting when we look here at this passage in Amos chapter 9 that's quoted in Acts chapter 15. What the thrust of that quotation of the book of Amos is, and this is the other point of emphasis that I would just urge each of us to think about as we think about application of the book of Amos, and that is the evangelistic application. If we understand what's being said here in Acts 15, 12 through 18, what we're looking at is Paul and Barnabas talking about the way God evangelized the Gentiles. And we find James then commenting on that from the book of Amos. And so one of the applications that I think that we can bring to our uh, study of the book of Amos as we look there at chapter 9 is not simply, am I living right and am I encouraging other people to live right? But we go to chapter 9 there right at the end. And we can begin asking ourselves the question and begin asking the question of the people to whom we teach the Bible. So what are you doing about seeing to it that the Gentiles are brought into the church? What are you doing in order that you see that the glory of God can be shown among the Gentiles? What are we doing to rebuild the tabernacle of David? And that gets very personal, doesn't it? Because that then begins to take us out of our little, our, our, uh, Christian conclaves. It takes us out of the protective environment of simply being in a group of believers drinking coffee or tea together. This takes us out to the place of where Paul and Barnabas were among the Gentiles preaching the gospel, seeing great signs and wonders happening and receiving persecution. 
And so the question that I would put before each of our hearts and that I put before my own heart, even as I share this, is what am I doing to take the glory of God to the Gentiles? What am I doing to take the gospel to the whole world? When was the last time that I made a deliberate effort to witness to a person about who Jesus is? And when I say made a deliberate effort, I'm not talking about some organized outreach where I was a part of a group of people who were organized and were basically, let's say, put on an airplane and sent somewhere to do, quote, do evangelism. What I am asking you and what I'm asking my own heart is, what about the person at the grocery store? What about the person who serves me coffee from the little coffee shack right down my road? What about the person who sells me nails in the hardware store? Do I try to make it a point in some way or another to remind them about the greatness of God and the glory of God and who Jesus is? Am I doing what I can to build up the tabernacle of David there based on what Amos chapter 9 verses 11 through 15 tell us? Because it's such a wonderful picture. That is pre in Amos chapter 9, it's preempted by the sun going down at midday, which of course also happened when Jesus died. So am I, am I doing my bit to see that God's glory goes to the Gentiles? Now the word Gentile, let me just talk about this for a minute. The word Gentile in both Hebrew and Greek is used in both of these languages not simply to mean ethnic Gentiles. It means all the nations of the world. It's talking about, am I seeing to it that I am involved in taking the gospel literally to the whole world? And that's a great challenge, isn't it? So what that means then is this book of Amos is not simply a book that's talking about God burning up cities. This is not simply a book that tells us about how angry God was because of the sins of his people. But this is a book that tells me, okay, right, I need to be very concerned about all that stuff. But there at the end of the book, when it's quoted in the book of Acts, it tells me I need to be involved and I need to be thinking about how can I take this gospel to every group of people in the world. And that is very challenging. 